how did you get from this desire to teach into the president? I mean, how did they know you were a candidate number one for teaching? Who made that decision? How did they know you were a candidate for being the president of the school? Who made that? Who who assessed you and said, "This is the right guy"? I'm so curious about how you ended up president, how you ended up teaching. I mean, you know, there had to be people that were instrumental along the way who put you in those positions. Well, those are actually two different, very different questions because I really wasn't assessed into why I could teach. It was a matter of the way that unfolded is kind of a, an interesting thing that reveals to me about how that, where that came from in me. When I was a student, um, I had a study group three of us. Brett, it was uh, Brett Ireland and Jay Burke and myself. And Brett Ireland and Jay Burke both graduated Sherman College with 4.0s. I graduated through Sherman College like in 3.87 or something like that. But we were the study group, <laughs> the two valedictorians and me. But the way that worked was this. They would get together and study and do all their memorization and read and read and read and read and read. And then my job, and it just kind of evolved this way, was I would get together with them the day before the test and quiz them. In other words, the only way I studied substantially when I was going through Sherman College was the time I spent with the material in hand. Of course, I was in class taking notes. I was not avoiding class. But to actually study would just be to sit down with that material and quiz people on it. So I actually started out my whole career as a teacher by being a test writer, essentially, because that's all I was doing for, for Jay and Brett. That's how we did it. And that helped all three of us get very high marks in all the classes because I taught that way. And then as we would go through that, if there was some part that they wouldn't understand, I would explain it to them. And so what happened was, as I was being a chiropractic student, I just had the opportunity to become a chiropractic teacher simultaneously just because of this helpful study group. And these were smart guys. It wasn't like, you know, I had to explain it because they're dummies. It's just like I had practice explaining things. So by the time I was in about in eighth quarter and Sherman College was starting up its CA program, they were asking for who could help. And I just flat volunteered. I said, sure, that sounds like fun. I do that for my study group. And so they assigned me to give some lectures to the CA students. I, my first class was four or five, four or five women, quite honestly, because they were the CAs were all women, mostly wives and girlfriends of the chiropractic students. And so that was a natural because, in fact, what I discovered from that is I love to lecture. I love to stand in front of people and explain things or talk about things. I, I'm a natural professor because of what the word professor means. It means someone who's willing to profess. And I pretty much was. So I started teaching spinal anatomy, which is very scientific and very detailed, just on the just on the fact that I studied the material and I had a good teacher when I took spinal anatomy, this same guy named Doug Gates, who wrote the book Spinal Anatomy for Chiropractors and wrote the book on muscle palpation, was my first teacher. And so I think that I was simply self-selected to be a teacher because I'm a, I'm a good teacher, and I'm not a good teacher by training. I think I'm just innately a good teacher because I've never had one lick of training in how to do it except 30 years of experience doing it. But I started out teaching the CA program, which was, of course, unaccredited and unregulated because it was just Sherman College's CA program, and it didn't have any status, so anybody could teach in it. But by the time I graduated... Both of the people who had been influential in teaching me spinal anatomy and philosophy were leaving the program. Doug Gates was moving on. Guy Rickman had left. <laughs> and so that, that opening just came open, and I was just a natural. I didn't have to convince anybody I should do that. I had been teaching both of those bodies of material. This was in 1981. There was no, I had my DC degree, so I was qualified as I needed to be. There were no other standards that said, you know, you have to have teacher training or an advanced degree or a bachelor's or anything else. And so I simply started teaching in the program. Now, how I became a good teacher is I like teaching so much that I was always open whenever Sherman College needed me to try teaching something else. I'd say, yeah, I'll try that. I... I only made a couple rules for myself as a teacher. One of the rules was I'm not going to teach something I don't, I'm not passionate about. I don't have to. You don't want me to teach for you? I'll just go into practice in full time and make lots more money because you know, you know, you don't know, make your money teaching. I used to support myself by practicing so I could afford to live on what they pay me to teach. But um, 
So I opened myself up and got wider and wider. I mean, going from spinal anatomy to teaching radiographic anatomy is a natural step. X-ray physics is natural because I'm a science background. When I was in high school, when I was in college, I've taken physics. I'm good at physics. So teaching physics was easy for me. I'd like to explain physics. I use a lot of physics when I talk about chiropractic. And then uh, spinal physiology. And I actually taught orthopedic checks at one point. Didn't like that. Didn't teach it more than a couple quarters. Just said, no thanks. I don't have to teach that because I don't care about it. And uh, just got better and better at it by doing it. Um, Becoming a good philosophy teacher was probably the most interesting thing of that because when I learned philosophy, I learned it out of Stevenson's textbook. But the way I taught philosophy, instead of just having them go through the principles and learn them or whatever, is I actually redeveloped the model, redeveloped the concept every time I went through it. In other words, the way I would teach principles to say, this is the starting assumption. From this assumption, what can we deduce? I wasn't even using Stevenson's principles. I wasn't using them as my list. I was just going through it and letting the kind of the students in the discussion lead to those points. In other words, I was just reworking the logical argument every time I taught it. So quarter after quarter after quarter, I had a class of 30, 20 to 30, 40 students, and we'd go through the logical argument. Well, as you do that, any logical argument evolves. So I was actually evolving that logical argument just by teaching it, not being constrained at Sherman by having to stick with the 33 principles, which is how they were. it was mostly being taught elsewhere. And so I became a pretty good philosophy teacher because I thought my way through chiropractic philosophy four times a year for 20 years, just teaching principles to third quarter Sherman students. And then by the time I had been teaching, I started teaching in 81, by the time 1996 rolled around, 1996 is just the year Tom Gillardi decided to retire. He decided he had enough being the president of the college, he would retire and become chairman of the board, which is what he did. And then, so then they said, but who's going to be president? So they opened it up to a search, and I had literally no ambitions and never thought, given it any thought that I would be the president of the college. I'm very happy being a faculty member, very happy practicing part-time. I'm working 45 hours a week just to teach four classes a week and practice 20 hours a week, you know, 25 hours teaching, 20 hours practicing, I'm already committed. So I wasn't looking for a different job or another job, but I got recruited. I got about five people on the faculty from within Sherman all said, you need to apply. We need you to apply. Why? I, you know, I'm just a good teacher because we need to have someone who's going to take over from Tom that really understands the philosophy. So I would say my only natural qualification to become president of Sherman College was that the board could have complete confidence that I knew exactly what the philosophy that they were building Sherman College around was because I've been teaching it for them for 20 years. Then when they actually made me um, president, actually they said, Tom said, I can't make you, we can't have you be president. You're going to have to be like senior vice president for about a year because you're going to have to learn some administrative skills, which is absolutely true. A teacher, administrative classroom. So I was actually senior vice president from uh, only for about seven months, from May of 95 till January, from May of 96 till January of 97. And then in 97, the board said, okay, Tom's ready to retire. You're, you're the president, and they appointed me president. And so I had, you know, enough training to be able to do the job. Tom Gillardi was still there to help me and advise me, and he was helpful. And uh, I was president for four years and did, did the best I could and enjoyed it thoroughly.